I'm one of the moderators, and I'm going to start by introducing our speakers, some of our speakers. Um, we're going to start with Charles McPherson to my left, who was born in Joplin, Missouri, and moved to Detroit at age nine. After growing up in Detroit, he studied with the renowned pianist Barry Harris and started playing jazz professionally at age 19. He moved to Detroit from New York in 1959 and performed with Charles Mingus from 1960 to 1972. While performing with Mingus, he collaborated frequently with Harris, Lonnie Hillier, George Coleman. Charles has toured the US, Europe, Japan, Africa, and South America with his own group, as well as with jazz greats, again, Barry Harris, Billy Eckstein, Lionel Hampton, Nat Adderley, Jay McShann, Phil Woods, Wynton Marsalis, Tarm Harrell, Randy Brecker, James Moody, Dizzy Gillespie, and others. Throughout his six decades of being an integral performer of music, Charles has not merely remained true to his bebop origins, but has expanded on them. Wynton Marsalis says, Charles is the very definition of excellence in our music. And um, I'd like to add, more importantly than all of this, he's my dad. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Roger Genver Smith who adapted his Obie award-winning solo performance of a Huey P. Newton story into a Peabody award-winning telefilm. His Bessie award-winning Rodney King is currently streaming on Netflix. Roger's signature, Frederick Douglass Now, was presented by the San Diego Repertory Theater, where he directed Katori Hall's Mountaintop and Radio Mambo, Culture Clash Invades Miami. His many screen credits include work inspired by Malcolm X, Madame C.J. Walker, Booker T. Washington, Thurgood Marshall, Rosa Parks, Nat Turner, and Jamaica Prime Minister Michael Manley. Roger studied at Yale University and Occidental College and has taught at both institutions, as well as Cal Arts, directing his performing history workshop. My name is Chris Cloud, and I'm the other moderator. Um, next to Roger is Gaiety Finney. Uh, he's the executive director of the San Diego African American Museum of Fine Art, a museum without walls, that collaborates with other organizations to present and preserve the art of African Americans globally and to broaden the knowledge and understanding of the visual arts throughout Southern California and the San Diego community. Most recently, they mounted Say Their Names, a memorial exhibit honoring individuals who have died at the hands of those perpetuating injustice and systematic, systemic racism part of a national-wide initiative spurred by the protests of 2020. He has served as executive director of the, the Aja Project and chief operating officer of Bayview Baptist Church. Guidi has also served four years as managing director of the North Coast Repertory Theater, Solana Beach, California. From 1997 to 2007, Mr. Finney served as assistant director of the San Diego Museum of Photographic Arts, MOPA. During his final year, he served as MOPA's interim director. Finally, next to me, we have Gil Sotu, who is a Navy veteran, poet, playwright, musician, DJ, and performing artist. He's a two-time Grand Slam po poetry champion, a two-time Raw Performing Artist of the Year, and a three-time TEDx San Diego presenter. Currently, he is a teaching artist and commissioned playwright with the Old Globe Theater and the La Jolla Playhouse, a guest teaching artist with the San Diego School of Creative and Performing Arts, and the official poet in residence for the San Diego Writers Festival. Gil is a former program director and teaching artist with the Intrepid Theater, creative director for TEDx San Diego, the 2020 Artist in Residence for the Gainesville Creative Forces Art Summit, as well as the former artist in residence for the Jacobs Center for Neighborhood Innovation and Maker Search. He has been commissioned to produce original pieces for leading arts and community organizations such as the San Diego Symphony, New Village Art Theater, the Unity Way, Feeding America, San Diego Fringe Fest, and the San Diego Opera, Name of View. 
and he's also one of the San Diego's most sought after DJs. And on top of that, I just found out that he's a father to three kids who the oldest is five. So on top of that, he's also a dad. I mean, I should have put that first in my bio. Uh, that's where I messed up. Don't tell my wife. So we'll get started with our questions. Um, this first one is gonna be addressed to all the group. So I think we'll start with you, Daddy, <laughs> and then we'll just go on. Um, reflecting back on your careers, I'm wondering if there was a pivotal moment that significantly shaped the trajectory of your artistic path. For me? Yes. Um, yeah, uh, I would say when I uh, had a chance to record uh, music that Billie Holiday sang and wrote and made famous. I did an album and a tribute to her. And um, of course I knew who she was and I had heard her, but this project made me really dig deep into her and listen to her. And so the thing that I got from her uh, was her complete honesty uh, in terms of her being able to convey the emotionality of these particular songs that she was singing. And listening to her, I could t what was different about her was that her understanding of the words were beyond dictionary definitions. Uh, everybody pretty understands, pretty much understands that. The difference was that not only does she know that, which is to be expected, but she understood in a deep way the emotionality of these words. And she really did sing them with that in mind. And for me, <clears throat> that changed my way of thinking because I'm a saxophonist and I'm not dealing with the spoken word. I'm dealing with notes, tones, and chords and these kind of things. But when I really checked her out and listened, then I realized that even though I'm playing a saxophone, I'm supposed to be doing what she's doing. She's using the spoken word and song as well. I'm supposed to connect in every note that I play. I'm supposed to not only understand it on an intellectual level, but on an emotional level. So it made the difference between me choosing notes because they were the correct notes but choosing notes because they emotionally made the case that I wanted to make. And for me, that was um, a quantum shift artistically. In other words, it made me view music, art, and everything else in a whole different way. Um, certainly also let me know if you'd like to hear the question again, but um, same question, Roger. Well, it all began at an NAACP convention where I was conceived. <laughs> and I emerged from that very dramatic moment uh, nine months later, uh, prepared to uh, take the world on um, as had I had been endowed in utero to do so. But Charles, you talked about Billie Holiday and I'll talk about Billie Holiday as well. I had the opportunity some years ago to do a beautiful play uh, by a man by the name of Oyamo called The Resurrection of Lady Lester, where I played the character of Lester Young, the great Brilliant. saxophonist whom Billie Holiday called the Prez, and he in return called her Lady Day. And they had a tremendous relationship. And when you listen to their seminal recordings, you can hear the love flowing between them. And you can also get the essence of this language of jazz um, I think you're very modest because you say that you play notes and chords, but you play a beautiful language 
uh, as well. Thank you. Um, and that's a language I think that we spoken folks are trying to catch up with. Um, what you have achieved, I think, is always the the signpost, uh, the goalpost for for what I do uh, as as someone who works with words. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope one day to 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 be able to achieve um, what you and the great uh, jazz maestros have, have achieved in this world. That is my inspiration. That is my goal and, and my abiding um, fascination to always listen uh, because what I do on stage is, is, yes, it's about talking a lot. It's about saying a lot of words, but it's also about listening. And thank you for providing. Well, thank you. That's a very beautiful compliment. And uh, if I could say this too, in terms of, for me, uh, I know it now. I didn't know it when I was 22, 23 years old, but I know now that we as artists, we're dealing with the human story. We're, we're dealing with the, the human condition. Um, I might play notes and tones and chords. Other people might be dealing with the spoken word. Whether the, it's words or it's notes, it's still dealing with the, home, the, the human mind, the home, human soul, the spirit, and what we feel, what we want. So it's all art is connected. The only thing that differs is the medium through which we are expressing it. I'm doing it with a saxophone. You might be doing it with words, literature. Doesn't make any difference. It's expressing the human condition. And um, the, the thing for us to do is develop our particular craft, whatever it is, playing saxophone, writing, uh, you know, uh, uh, plays, whatever, is to have the craft spot on and then just play your soul. And then when you got craft holding hands with art, you have heart, inspiration, you have left brain, right brain, um, and you have technique and inspiration. When they all hold hands, you have genius. And that's what, for me, what you're supposed to aspire to. I'm gonna need someone to write that down for me, please. <laughs> you next, why don't you answer the next? <laughs> no, kill. Man. Go for it. Uh, I'm a, uh, when I, I go to these conferences, I'm usually out there and, and um, just trying to soak in uh, everything. There's such greatness on the stage. I, I'm really, really in awe. Uh, to answer the question, though, uh, I think the moment for me that, that really changed a lot, I had been performing you know, pretty much all my life, but uh, there was one time I was in Ojai, California, and I was performing... Uh, uh, at a Martin Luther King Day celebration and you know I was doing spoken word and I was singing and everything and there was just this one moment when I was performing and the, the sun came out and and people I could look across the crowd and everybody was in sync connected and 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 really in spirit inspired and it the thought occurred to me uh, very strongly that I need to be doing this for the rest of my life so I was always the type that I always took care of myself, you know, from 18 on, no parents uh, uh, financially helping me out or whatever. Uh, and so what was funny about that situation is when I got home from that weekend, I had a, a, a card in the mail. It wasn't my birthday, it wasn't any special occasion. And my mom, uh, she was living in Atlanta at the time, she wrote me, uh, congratulations on your new job. And I was still working the same job and, but it said, congratulations on your new job, the, the one God just gave you. And, and, and it was miraculous, and she didn't know about that weekend or anything, it just uh, kind of came together and it just cemented. And I have a lot of, I call those moments ordinary magic. Um, and I have a, a lot of those moments in my life and in my career that really gave evidence as to this is what I'm supposed to be doing, you know? Whether it, when it gets hard, when it when it's good, but I, I just know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So, least. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm humbled by these gentlemen. I mean, they are fantastic. Me, I, 
I am what you call an art warrior. I am an art warrior. And how that started for me, it was actually in high school. I was living in New Jersey, working with a thing called C Fund, the Committee for Unified Newark with Imamu Baraka, the famous poet Leroy Jones, who gave me my name, Gaidi. Gaidi means gorilla, not gorilla, but guerrilla, warrior. It's 1972 when I graduated high school was the year of the gorilla. And so I took that. Now, that study of black nationalism with Imam Uraka had to do with the Ngusa Saba, what you know of as Kwanzaa. And one of the elements of Kwanzaa is Kaumba, creativity. And what it says is to leave the world better than you inherited it. That's creativity. And that's my mantra, that's my mission, that's the reason I'm an art warrior, is I do that. And I find that it's a God-given talent to be able to make these things happen. And I have done it 50 years, 40 years, and my whole career is making art happen. And I've been successful, I've done it without money, I've done it with money, but it's my passion, it's my belief, is to make the world better than I inherited it. Thank you. I mean, kind of going off of that and just thinking about the, the likes of the people that y'all have collaborated with, what is sort of like the best advice that you have gotten in, in your career so far? Does anyone want to start? I had the opportunity to meet a guy by the name of Bob Marley in Kingston, Jamaica. And Bob told me two very memorable things. Um, he said, you have a song, sing it. And he also told me, if you play football, get a team. Mm. That's pretty good advice. Yeah. You know, there's so many times that you want to give up. I mean, this, this, daily almost, you think, man, this is hard. You know, it's just hard. But the people who enjoy the work that we do, when I see the kids' eyes brighten looking at an exhibit I put together, when I see uh, tears coming, and an exhibit that we've done for Say Their Names, it made it all worthwhile. I mean, I, you just know the challenges, the fundraising and the glad racking, the handshake, all the things you have to do to make things happen. When it's done and it's beautiful, it's worth it. And I just believe that the goodness of what we do will always come about. Uh, my story is a little different. It wasn't by someone like the, this, uh, uh, a great artist, in fact, he, <laughs> I'm not gonna say any names, but he was pretty mediocre as an artist. He used to, every time we played, uh, I played with him, he'd always pop a bust the guitar string. And, um, but, and I would always get upset about it. But then one day he said something to me, and, and sometimes our lessons don't come from somebody that you look up at here, it could come from anybody, really. And he said to me, what's supposed to happen on stage is gonna happen. Like it's you know you 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 get prepared you do what you're gonna do but what's supposed to happen is gonna happen and that always just sat with me to and it and it helped me to not fear so much the the result of what I what it what it is that I was putting out I just worried about my journey worried about being prepared myself and then being I found myself more and more being independent of the results of of what happened. Um, because you know, uh, some things are going to fail, some things are going to succeed, but uh, you just keep rocking on if it's if it's what you're supposed to do, you know. You know, I want to add uh, the inspirational part. I was in high school. Been, I was involved in the committee for Unified Newark, Core, NACB, everything. I burned myself out and quit high school. Never finished. And I started working in Saddlebrook, uh, New Jersey at a UPS packing boxes and all that. And one of my friend's father said, you know, man, you're too smart. You need to go to school. You need to go and finish. And so I was able to get into college and through law school and finished all of that. But that, that man who said to me, look, stop all that. 
I know you're tired, but come on, you, you, you have to keep going. You got to try. Go to school. And I did. And I finished all those. I have a doctorate. Thanks to him. Yeah. Well, uh, I remember there are many moments where uh, these epiphanies can happen because of somebody or some situation. Uh, I remember being in a jazz club <clears throat> years ago and great pianist Thelonious Monk was, I was in his presence and some young person came up and um, asked Monk, how did he become so original? And those of you, I don't know how much you know about Thelonious Monk, but he was a great jazz piano player, very different from a lot of piano players and very original, and he was known for that. So the young person said, uh, how did you become so unique and, and so original? Now, Thelonious Monk was a man of not many words. He didn't talk much. And he, for a moment, he thought, and then he answered this person, and then he said, you are a genius because you look like yourself. And what he meant by was, that you are already a genius and you just don't know it. I got in touch with mine and I delve deep and you maybe have not, but you are already a genius. It took millions of years for DNA to arrive at this point and the fact that you are who you are, you are already original and uh, you just got to work on it. And for me, that was a big light bulb went off on that. Because uh, that's really true. We all are capable of that. Um, and uh, that's a great thing to know because um, that means all you have to do is be creative and not, the worst thing you can do is be lazy and do nothing. Just be yourself, pure consciousness, straight ahead, I don't care what, it, it could be music, it doesn't make any difference what it is, but just do it with uh, gusto and, and do it. And genius will come out, because you are. That's it. You know, I, I guess I have a kind of a follow-up question to that, and I'm thinking about sort of like, obviously the, the awareness that we're all black people on stage right now, and, and that the struggles for us as black people are, are harder sometimes. And it, it does seem that sometimes that there are sort of like, you know, I, I think about it, well, I, I just want to go out and make stuff or like, what, what, how do I even do it? And we were talking earlier about like artist residencies and how like, we didn't know that that was a thing, that you could be a, a resident artist and you can actually have, get paid to create art, have space to create art. I didn't, you know, attend my first residency until I was in my like, 30s, you know, and I didn't, didn't occur to me. I think you, 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 we were talking earlier about ours residency. So I guess I'm thinking about how do we sort of find out about the opportunity to, to, to be the genius, to sort of go out there and do it. And then I would almost, my other kind of question is like, how can we open those doors for, for our brothers and sisters out there that, that elevate them? So, I mean, I, maybe this is a question for you. Well, anyone can answer, but um, one thing that I found that if you have something that you're passionate about, a dream that you're passionate about, um, a lot of people hold that very close to the, ch to the vest, right? Uh, and I have found repeatedly throughout my life, and it may be different for yours, but in my life, when I started uh, really talking to, speaking to people about what it is that I intended to do, and, uh, and, and I always had the intention that I'm gonna do this with or without anyone else's money or whatever, right? I'm not telling them to say, I need your help. I'm telling them because I'm passionate about it, right? So uh, two very distinct times, uh, and it was for the same project, a long time ago, uh, I, was, I told someone in passing at a, one show that I wanted to do a spoken word opera. I'd never even been to an opera before, but those two things sounded cool together, spoken word and opera, right? And then, um, and so two years later, the lady, uh, the woman that I spoke to uh, said, hey, I wanna get coffee with you. And uh, she said, hey, I've been thinking about that spoken word opera idea. Are you still interested in doing that? I was like, yeah, uh, definitely. And she's like, I wanna fund it. 
And that turned into an artist residency where it, it is actually my full salary to create like different works for it. Start telling other people about it. Uh, uh, an archaeologist, uh, a black man that was is a champion of the arts here in San Diego, was uh, heard about it and took me to lunch and and wanted me to tell him my the, my idea. And he's like, you know what? Uh, two weeks later from me meeting him, he wrote me a check for $10,000 to produce it and stuff. And, and it wasn't going in my pockets. I was able to hire young black artists and hire, get an actual set that looked nice and a, and a venue that looked nice and everything like that. Um, and again, I, going back to the, 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 the times of ordinary magic, but I think when you start to lay your vision out there, people want to help you. You know, you, but if you're quiet about what it is that you're intending, then they don't know that they can help you. There's, there's people out there like, hey, I know this person, oh, you should hook up with this person or whatever, and it happens all the time, but when you're, you're quiet about it. So going back to how can, so I just speak to a lot of brothers and sisters out here who, who keep their dream close to their vest, and I know that if they start telling people about it, then, then they're gonna say, oh, there's a grant. Cause I hear this all, there's a grant that you can apply for, and, and you'll be able to get it, because they're looking, you know, black is cool right now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, so, uh, it's always been, but. Um, but uh, then, you know, someone will say, like, there's opportunities out there, there's this grant going on, on there. I go to some of these, like, art council meetings and, and other things, and I'll be the only black face in there, or one of very, very few. And it's just that people do not know about these opportunities, and they have the money. They have, they get grants, uh, the big arts organizations, especially here in San Diego, they get grants specifically for diversity, and, but they don't have the contacts to reach the, the average Joe. So they need middlemen like me and people like you to, to, to tell people. So for you all, the best thing that you can do, and I assume, because you're spending a Thursday night listening to all of us, that you're art lovers. So when you come across these opportunities, uh, I behoove you to send it out to people that you know that really may benefit from it. Don't just click away. Like really send it to people and say you should, because sometimes it's that spark of, oh man, like, okay, this is the sign I've been looking for all this time that, that something like this is happening, you know? Let me just say, you know, and I talk about how we met because it's interesting, because I think one of the things is to be able to trust each other as artists and talk to each other. And I, I have huge visions. I mean, ideas that are out of this world are huge. And one of the ones I had was for the Say Their Names exhibit was a glory chant with some poetry behind it. And I didn't know what it was gonna look like. So I talked to uh, Alice, Smith, she's here. Elise, I'm sorry, Elise, pardon me for our pronunciation. And she said, talk to Gil. You talk to Gil and you will talk to him and see what he says. Well, I called Gil up and bang, we connected just like that. He saw my vision, he had the vision to make it work and we did it, it was completed and it was wonderful. That's just from talking among each other. So that's super important. Thank you, Elise. Elise is Thank in you, the Gil. house right now. There she is right wonderful there. Wonderful poet, you so much. actor. Okay, so we'll go to the next question. Um, so I wanted to ask this, because um, I'm a ballet dancer, and I know that you know, throughout my career, the way I performed as like a 21-year-old versus the way I perform, perform now as a not 21-year-old <laughs> um, <laughs> has, has definitely changed, I think, for the better, just because I've, I've lived more, and so I feel like I don't have to go up and, and pretend that I'm connecting with this certain feeling, like I feel like I've lived it. So I wanted to ask, um, how have your senses of artistry or artistic expression changed with the developments of your career as you've grown older and, and emerged as um, really outstanding artists? Uh, let me see. I, well, I think the magic word is living life. I, the magic word is living life. So as you get older, um, besides just physically getting older. I mean, you are hopefully learning, experiencing uh, life itself, which is uh, fraught with, with everything, extreme uh, of pain, ex extreme uh, sorrow, uh, all the, the other end of the spectrum, just joy, ecstasy, and everything in the middle mystery, uh, confusion, uh, delight, you got all these different feelings. And um, 
So as you get older, um, hopefully you one learns how to how to play the play the cards right, and uh, and and. And in terms of art and, and whatever it is you do, since we, this is what we're talking about, um, you, for me, I realize that for me to be the best artist I can, even though I'm playing music, really I have to be, and you correct me because I know you know the right word, thespian, is that the right word? Am I, okay, that's close. That's one of them. Okay, all right, so I'm, as I said earlier, I'm dealing with music, but I'm dealing with hu the human uh, emotional system in the menu. Um, so I have to be an actor. So if I'm playing a song that's dealing with deep sadness, I have to, as a human being, really know what deep sadness is. It can't be empirical. I have to have experienced it. If you live long enough, you will experience it. So I put my craft to, to that. So I have to be, a, a, you know, I'm, at this moment, deep sadness. Five minutes later, I'm playing another song that might be dealing with ecstasy, joy. Well, then for that moment, I'm that. Well, I have to, as a human being, know what joy is, to have felt it. Uh, and so that's what I mean, um, is that you, you can't convey to one other human being anything that you haven't felt yourself. And, and I think when you really know how to do that, you connect with people because people, everybody knows what sadness is. Everybody knows what happiness is. Um, so for me, that, uh, for, you know, yeah, <laughs> okay. Roger? Um, my family really started in California, right here in San Diego. My father came to San Diego, a World War II veteran and a Howard University School of Law graduate. And he realized that there were no black attorneys in the city of San Diego. And there was a lot of work to be done here. And a lot of my father's work had to do with the desegregation of these hotels right here in San Diego. The El Cortez, for example, the U.S. Grant, for example. And whenever we visited uh, San Diego from L.A., where we eventually settled, I just wanted to go to the zoo. But my father always wanted to go to the El Cortez. And I said, Dad, why, are we, why do we always come to this place? And then he said, don't worry, son, you'll understand one day. Why are we going to the U.S. Grant Hotel, Dad? We're not staying here, are we? No, but it's important. One day, you'll understand. And this is the process of life. This is the process of living. This is the process of overstanding, of understanding. The process that we go through as Americans, as Americans of African descent, of native descent, of even European descent, most of us. And this is a, a journey which is not done in a single chapter. It's a journey that is an epic poem uh, that we're trying to right every day because those kids are running around and we're hoping that one day they will understand as well. That's right. And then if I can add, um, uh, for the artist and, and say in particular the black artist, um, you know, there, there are some obstacles there just, just as a, as, as a, a uh, art, art, an artist, I don't care, it can be blue, green, yellow, black, yellow, red, it doesn't make a difference. Just because you, you're do, doing art, which is, you know, is, is subjective, it's is philosophy. One person 
can love this, another person can hate it. So it's, you're dealing with something that's ethereal and it's a matter of taste. So that's already a dangerous livelihood and one must be in love with it because it doesn't mean you're going to make a lot of money. In fact, it's usually the opposite of that. So you must have the passion uh, to, to do this anyway. Uh, but then as a black artist, there, there are some, some obstacles that are there as well. And um, I think uh, to, uh, when one has to deal with that and overcomes that, there is a strength, a strength that, is, uh, that you get from, from that as well. And, uh, and just like what my friend said here, uh, this experiment here that we call democracy, um, it is truly an experiment. And it, do, it, do, it, do, it hasn't really worked, to tell you the truth. Because the world leans toward author authoritarianism, dictatorship. It doesn't really work. And uh, America is a, a, a big experiment. And it's either going to work here or it's not going to work. And so we as artists have to um, persevere on with our art. We have to deal with all of the negativities that we have to deal with. And we still have to be hopeful and strong and, um, and, and just keep the vision and be strong in, in spite of everything, in spite of things that are against you. That's all we have is, is to be able to survive. Both these gentlemen talked about Bob Marley and the team and the strength. As I grew from my 20s, I learned about having a team. And one of the big things about the things that I've done and my museum has done, our museum, is to polish the exhibits that we do. They're just not regular. We make it elegant and beautiful. No, n nothing that we left behind. We should have done the shit that, that we make sure that we cover. And there's, a, there's a strength working with great people. I met Ramel Wallace, who's here. He's on my board, a younger gentleman. And the other thing is you, you have to bring people with you who are younger. And I recognize his talent and his ability to communicate, and I wanted him to be part of what I do. And there's a certain power in bringing people along with you, bringing other artists that are younger with you. And so for us, it's not only putting on exhibits, but making powerful, beautiful, no regrets exhibits that really make a difference, working with people who want to polish it. So when you see it, you, you know that they care about this exhibit, that they care about the work that they're doing, that they want to give something really beautiful to the world. So that's what's changed over my, my years growing up from 20 till now. Is there's a certain power of collaboration, working with great people, but making sure that when you do it, you don't have regrets. You do the best you can with what you have. And Things will happen for you. Thank you. Gil? Um, so the question's about you know, your art and as you, as you age. Um, one of the, the biggest joys in my life is uh, without any, well, let me, let me see how I'm gonna say it. Uh, there's something inside of me that, that has to help other people tell their stories. You know, like uh, when I uh, when I was in the Navy, I got a bunch of the sailors. I had never been to an open mic, never even heard of them. There wasn't anywhere I was from. Uh, I got a bunch of sailors uh, to sit around in the mess decks and just share our art. You know, when I when I got out, uh, I started an open mic. Uh, now I knew what to call it. I started an open mic in my garage, and everybody was shy to share their stuff. But we just kind of sat there, and I just kept reading poems till someone decided to get up. Um, now in my life, just tomorrow, I got to wake up at like 4.30 in the morning and I drive to, every Friday I go to Centinella State Prison and I teach Shakespeare, but it's reflecting Shakespeare. So uh, we get to hear 
their ideas and hear their poetry and their words on the themes of Shakespeare. Um, and in a given week, it is this, just this morning, I was in a, a juvenile court school. I'll go into the San Diego Rescue Mission. I'll go into like all these different spaces and help people tell their story. George Senior, uh, George Stevens Senior Center. I work there a lot. Um, so what has been beautiful about aging is to be able to A, help all those people tell their story, and then B, have all these stories and characters and people and, and hopes and dreams all inside of me, because I remember a lot of their stories and, and I hear their voices. So it, it helps when, as, as a playwright uh, and as a poet to, to convey messages that uh, I can speak I can spit in a in a bar in a church in a school where wherever and it, it is because of the work that I, I get to do not even that I have to do that I get to do and I'm so happy that I'm able to do that and then the other side of that is I think as you get older you, <laughs> you start to do things more efficiently you know <laughs> you don't you don't waste a, a, a lot of time because we know that time is finite for us uh, we don't know when it's going to end but it's finite for us the work will always happen there's always work to be done but time is finite and and so uh, I just learned to do things more efficiently uh, learn not uh, to to not be so afraid to say no to things, you know, those kind of things. Uh, and you know who you are as an artist too. You start to know really and, you, and hear your voice and know your voice. So that's also been a beautiful thing with, with age. So earlier, you know, you, you said, Gil, that black is cool and black has always been cool and I agree with that. Yes, yes, sir. And I think about the, the past sort of 18, 19 months that we've, we've had as, as a society, right, with the pandemic and then with the, the, the tragic murder of George Floyd. Uh, and I'm from Minneapolis and I've, I've been to that store before. I, you know, I, I went to his memorial last August and I watched last June when a lot of cultural institutions across the country all had their black, you know, black uh, background, white tax, making, you know, promises and assertions of how we can be, make more equitable futures and create more spaces for, for black people. But like, I had to look at this event right now, which is a, you know, from Rising Arts Leader San Diego, which is a community sort of driven organization, holding the space for black people on the stage right now. And we don't necessarily see that too much at these other cultural institutions around us right now. So I guess my question for all of us up here is, how can we hold these institutions and industries and museums and operas and symphonies accountable for the promises that they made to us as black artists and black creators and black communities last, last June to be more equitable, diverse, accessible? Well, I'll just say this real quick because uh uh, you know, the, our, our old saying, a closed mouth don't get fed. So you have to, you know, really uh, make your voice heard, make it known, let them, let them know, and, and come, with, come to them with not just, uh, I was just thinking about this the other day, when anybody, and this is just my own personal opinion, this doesn't reflect the, the panel here, of course, but I was just thinking, I, I, when I'm listening to other people talk, when they say, we need to, uh, most people who say we need to do such 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 and it's talking about we need to get together we need to do this then I, I I feel like it's a lot of lip service when I think the better statement is I need to do this you know when we say I need to do this you know what I need to organize uh, but I am going to not even I need to I am going to organize this committee or whatever So when you come to these organizations, man, you just have to come with a, a, a solid plan Like do your homework and and really don't just say like hey You guys need to have more diversity and then walk away because they don't know what to do with that You have to say hey, I have this idea for an event uh, We're gonna hold it at the courtyard and you know blah 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 and then go with it. That's just my two cents I agree. I, that that that's definitely it, uh, because um, look, if you're going to wait for the humanity or whatever else it is for anybody to do anything, then you have to be waiting a long time. So, what you can do is exactly what you said: is that you. You have to do yourself 
And it, just doing that is being creative. You do. You write the play. Uh, you create the situation. You do it. Uh, and then it will have a way of being attractive to other people, no matter who they are. Because when we use terms, they, why don't you do this? Um, if you think about that, um, it's not, not, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done, or the fair thing would be for it to be done. All of that is exactly right, of course. But that doesn't mean that it's going to happen. So you can't wait for it. You must do, you must produce. Uh, if you don't see yourself represented in the movies, then start getting into the movies yourself. Start reading, uh, writing, the, do it, just do it. And then, you know, it, it could be attractive. Because what else do you have? Yeah, but your own self and your own volition and your own dreams. Um, that, that is, uh, that, that's the key. And I would say this too, um, one of the, the, the negative things that can happen or does happen to oppressed people, I don't care what color they are, what culture they are, just oppressed people. In this case, brown people. <laughs> um, besides the physicalities of you can't do that, the worst thing of all is not the physical restraints, but what it does to the mind and what it does when it strangles expectations and your dreams and you, what you think to dream about or even try for is narrow. And so you don't dare think way over this way, up that way. And your vision is this little small little area and so the oppression, the worst thing that could happen is that you, your vision is not the same as other people because you've been through hundreds of years of thinking, I can only think this way and only these parameters. Now, things are different to a degree. It's not totally cool, we know that, but it is different. And one of the things for us is to not be shackled in the mind. The vision is, can be wide as heck and not be in the small orbit of thinking, but this big panoramic view, meaning that you can do anything you want. And that must be, uh, that is a muscle that has to be used and, uh, and the more you do it, the better it is and this, it is attracting to people, because I don't care who the people are, when they see it, they have to recognize that it's excellent. And it just has a way of having its own life. And we as uh, people, uh, we, this is the only choice we have. You can't wait for some, the beneficence of somebody else to do anything. You got to do, do it yourself, and then maybe that will come. But the worst thing is to do nothing. You know, I when think, I... I'm sorry, finish yet. No, I'm through. When I think about last year, and I want to drive this home, because I think we kind of don't get it, maybe you do, but the George Floyd protests happened during COVID. In other words, they could have died just from the virus, all those crowds of people. And we don't, sometimes don't put those two things together. And it's not the only time that's happened. I call it the Popeye moment. Kind of funny, but you know, I had all I could stand. I can't stand no more, right? And so that's what happened with George Floyd to me. That, that just made it like, you know, that's it. That's all, and we all, all of us felt it. But I want to talk about a project that I'm working on just because it's related, because that's not the only time that happened. We're working on an exhibit called The Freedom Writers in 61. And there was a story about a young woman, uh, her name was Nash, uh, she was a student. And she was down there and a, one of the representatives from the um, Kennedy administration was there trying to talk to her. And 
she was against a wall or a car or something, and she was ready, getting ready to be beat down. And the guy's trying to say, sister, you better get out of the way. He, she said, no, we signed our death sentences last year, our, our last will and testaments last, last night. We knew, we know we might die. You, we were trained to take this beating. You're not, you need to get out of the way and let me take this beating. Now this happened in 61. It happened this year as well. It's that, it's not, a closed mouth does not get fed. People need to stand up and say and do things to make a change. And we still have to do that. It will happen again. All the people I know are still concerned, as you mentioned about, how long is this highlight of black people going to last? You, know, you better take advantage of it now or else you know, this will be somebody else's time. So it's important that we recognize to do something to take it on, to continue to fight, continue to fight for the arts, to be in the forefront of some of these things. Thanks. Um, I just want to say one last thing and use Gaidi as an example. Uh, even if you are not like the writer or the actor or, or even the person who's going to be on the podium speaking, if there's something that's in your heart that you're passionate about, then you can hire the actor, hire the, uh, the speaker, um, you know, organize and, and and make the calls or get the money to fund these people to to help create your vision um and that's just as infectious you know you don't have to be the the person to make things these things happen so i just wanted to throw that out there for those of you who, who don't uh you know identify as artists or whatever it is that you want to do so my question is jazz is collaborative and improvisational and um, what can the next generation of jazz artists, or I suppose artists in general, learn from your generation? Well, I think uh, one thing they can learn is uh, how everything is connected. The past is um, a lot of, at least in my world, the jazz where a lot of young musicians, um, they think that uh, when they enter, then this is when everything is uh, uh, it, like it started with them. And quite often they don't understand the l linear connections of what went on before that in a linear way connects, 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 connects. And they don't seem to think uh, that, uh, I don't think they are aware of that. And I don't think they think it's important in the first place. But it is important because um, it's not just with music, it's, it's with with life, period. Um, we, we, you have to learn from what went on first. And then you, if you understand the past, you will have a better understanding of the now. And um, so I would, I would make them uh, learn the history of the music, not just what music is in 2021, but what was it, a, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago and understand the connections. That's what I would do, just in terms of music. Yeah. And, and, and I think this is for Gaidi. I mean, Gil was saying just now about creating your own path, right? So, I mean, I'm thinking about the museum that you helped start it, right? Where you saw sort of a void that was missing in San Diego and you sort of, sort, sort of filled that. So could you maybe talk about how that kind of came to be and maybe your vision for it? Sure. I. I was, um, when I first moved to San Diego from Minneapolis, I was on the board of the San Diego African American Museum with Shirley Day Williams, who passed away around 1999. And so the museum itself was dormant for all those years. So I started working at the uh, Baby Baptist Church where they have a, a big room that looks like a gymnasium, but they use it as a special events place. And I said, I could put the museum there. So we revived, revived the museum in 2014 because as you mentioned earlier, you very seldom see a lot of black people. You see a lot of them at church, but other than that, you don't see a lot in San Diego. And I wanted to really, our mission is to bring what we call the best African and African diaspora art from around the world here to San Diego. And so that's our, that's our lane, is to try and stay there, bringing things from the Smithsonian, from other cities that are traveling and bring them here, or, if, or the one we just finished, it can travel from here around the world. So that's been our quest is to, to do that kind of thing. But it really was uh, on, on the shoulders of Shirley Day Williams that we 
continued this artistic fight, and my idea of being an art warrior really helped that. My next question is for Roger. Um, how do you choose your characters, and what role have they played in American history and in the social justice movement? So just how do you go about choosing stories to tell? I think quite frequently my subjects choose me. Um, I'm merely a vessel to be played. Um, this is my instrument. This is my instrument. This is my instrument. And, you know, sometimes I have the opportunity to be in other people's plays, like Oyama's Lester Young play. Um, but more frequently, I find myself digging into the archives to try to find some sort of truth uh, about America, about myself, about uh, who we are as a people, about our aspirations and our disappointments uh, as a people and as people. Um, one of my first uh, solo performances was playing Christopher Columbus. And we just had what used to be Columbus Day earlier this week. And, you know, I played him in 1992, which was the quincentennial of his alleged discovery of America. And there was a lot of celebration going on all over this country. And there was a lot of protests going on as well. And I didn't want to just come out and, and say that Columbus was a bad guy. You know, let's cancel Columbus. I wanted to come out and really believe in Columbus and play him um, as, a, as a man who is still among us. Uh, a lounge entertainer with political aspirations who runs a travel agency on the side. And uh, that is a, is a way that, that I maneuvered myself into uh, the history of this hemisphere, a history in, in which I continue to be uh, engaged in any number of ways. At uh, Old Globe uh, Theater, there was supposed to be a centennial celebration of the completion of the Panama Canal. And for those of you who are San Diego residents, you know that Balboa Park was built in large measure to celebrate the completion of that tremendous job connecting the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. And those buildings there, those, you know, uh, Spanish colonial revival buildings in Balboa Park were built 100 and some odd years ago in celebration of that moment. And the money that was supposed to celebrate in this city was uh, stolen, was pocketed. So the celebration never occurred, including a play which I was commissioned to write and perform, which I entitled 500 Lives Per Mile. And that is the human cost of building the Panama Canal. It was black labor from Barbados, Trinidad, and Jamaica which dug the canal. And it was an American endeavor, so they needed English-speaking labor. The Panamanians weren't going to cut it. And dynamite was then being used as a new technology. And Bodies were getting blown up to bits every day. And every night you would hear the mourning coming out of the tents of the laborers 
who had lost their comrades building this canal to make the 20th century the American century. And the first time that a sitting U.S. president left the country was when Theodore Roosevelt went to the Panama Canal to see the progress that they were making there. And of course, the black laborers were not making the same cash as the white um, bosses. And there was segregation all down the line. And these were black men who were not used to this kind of Jim Crowism because they were from Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad. Um, so I continue to be haunted um, by these recurring themes in, in the American history. And, and those, those ideas, those histories, those plays, those theaters come to me in dreams, but moreover in nightmares. And it was the great Irishman James Joyce who said, history is the nightmare from which I am trying to awake. Yeah, yeah I never knew about those, uh, the Panama Canal or, or those losses. So it's, it's heavy to hear that obviously on the stage, but I, I think you said something about recurring themes. I want to think about you, you know, you're such a sort of multi, multi-talented artist and creator, and you have so many different kind of medias, that, the mediums that you explore. Is there a recurring theme for the artwork that you kind of put out? Or, or is there a way to kind of tie spoken word and all the other things you do together? Uh, before I answer that, I just want to acknowledge just uh, the wisdom that is, is on this board to my right that is just so wonderful to hear that uh, either if I was on, on the stage or out here, uh, this is such a, a treasure to behold, I, I guess. Uh, I knew nothing about that either, Roger. Um, but to answer your question, uh, I, I discovered a long time ago, you know, whatever it is I'm doing, uh, teaching, writing, performing, even DJing, uh, it's all about connection. Uh, I, it's all, for me, it's about connecting different communities. Even when I was in high school, like, I was able to jump to the jocks, to the nerds, to the drama kids, to everybody. Uh, and I was just, uh, I was actually voted most friendly because I was just like a social butterfly. Um, so I, I discovered a long time ago that uh, my work is about building bridges, you know, and, and connecting these communities. We spoke earlier uh, about how, um, you know, the black community here in San Diego isn't uh, really in large numbers a part of the artsy fartsy world <laughs> over here of, of all these uh, entities and and so any chance I get I want to I want to introduce these two worlds together because there's talent and there's passion and there's promise on either side uh, so I, I feel like that's that's my life's work you know and if I continue in that and, and I stumble then it's okay because I'm just trying to give this gift that I have of connecting. I always say my superpower is just knowing dope people and connecting those those people together, so, yeah. And kind of follow for, for Gaidi, I mean, with being a museum without walls, it seems that you have a great opportunity to connect sort of black storytelling and, and, and sort of black stories with maybe some of these organizations that, you know, might not be thinking those terms. So, so could you think about, uh, or could you speak about sort of like your vision for how you can connect you know others and i think you you also mentioned when we talked about thinking about the museum now as, as globally right so it's not even about connecting others within our community but maybe across the world sure what, what happened with covid in my opinion was all the music came without walls it's like nobody could go to a museum so you had to figure out what to do um without people going in there and we've always done that so to me a door opened We've always been a museum without walls, so we wanted to then be a more powerful museum without walls. Now, being a museum without walls, of course, you have to connect your exhibit with a particular museum and see if it fits. So it's a little hard because you gotta go through that, like, will it fit here, will it fit there, will they appreciate that? And with, with the highlight on black people, it's been a little bit easier to at least have conversations, but not necessarily to 
mount the exhibits, but at least to have the conversations. But it is really, um, a lot of doors have opened with regard to us having a, a place to be in various museums. When I think of us now, I think, wait a minute, if we're gonna have a local exhibit, we could also have an international exhibit as well to go with it. And that's what I mean about globalization of our museums so that we can produce a, a local exhibit here and also an online exhibit that can go around the world. In fact, we have one that's ready to go. Well, I'll probably release it, I'm hoping, for Giving Tuesday that will release for the last exhibit, uh, um, the Say the Names exhibit, that will be online and you can experience and know all about that. And same thing with the Freedom Riders that we're gonna do in the future, we'll do that as well. But it's important that we expand because we're just as important as the Louvre or as the Smithsonian as a museum without walls. And we wanna take advantage of that. So that's the door that opened and we're going through it, we're going dancing through it. My man. How can we best amplify black voices in the arts and culture sector in San Diego and beyond, right through mentorship, advocacy, networking, share resources, and how can we work across generations? So that's the thing that's so beautiful about this stage right now, is that, like you said, right, to, to, the, to the right of us, there's so much like wisdom and experience and, and just lived like life. So, so how can we sort of amplify other black voices? And how do we do that? across generations. One of the interesting things we did early on was we had young docents for our museum. They were 12 to 18. And they uh, did the civil rights uh, exhibit that we did. And it was funny, it was very circular because we had the older generation being um, toured by the young kids and they would tell the stories and the young kids who had to study before they could talk about it would get even more experience and knowledge about what they were talking about by this this circular education. So one thing is to involve young people early on. Uh, even when we did to say the names, we did uh, kids projects on Saturdays where they did uh, postcards, they made paper flowers, to, that so wasn't so dramatic. But it really is important to, to bring along young people um, as you do your work and make sure that they also have access to their elders to learn from them. Gil, Roger, do you have any thoughts on how we can further amplify black voices in, the, in our communities or, or even our industries? That's how All you right, do that it. That box says. <laughs> Voices amplified. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, I'm with, with, you know, it's like engagement building bridges, uh, uh, you know, making known what you want. And then uh, I, I can't, some of the things you said earlier, I can't, I mean, that's it to me. It's, yeah. Yeah, I would say uh, if you have the resources or you know someone who has the resources, um, you know, uh, help them find the artists to match up with those resources so they can create. Like, the, the idea, I think for a lot of young black people, the idea that someone can say, hey, I want to fund this vision of yours or fund something that you're, you're passionate about is, is just like a fairy tale. That's our fairy tale, you know? Uh, Cause we, we are taught and learn and, and embody the hustle. Like we just gotta hustle and get it. And that's true. But if, if you're able to, to do that, then uh, I think that that would um, really, especially here in San Diego, there was a program that I was a coach for, uh, which was the August Wilson monologues first year that we had it here in San Diego and um, and we were supposed to go to, we had our finals, we were supposed to go to New York, we had the students ready and it was a beautiful thing because it was students of all color, uh, men and women uh, were, were playing these amazing, uh, doing these amazing monologues. Then COVID happened and we couldn't do the uh, go to New York and, and everything, it was a letdown. And then the theater, because of COVID, the theater went under uh, that was sponsoring it and and so I've been trying to find uh, uh, an organization or someone to help me fund um, getting this program back on. So again, closed mouths don't get fed. So if anyone knows or is interested in, in helping to fund the August Wilson monologues, then, then holler at me. But um, 
Yeah, so just things like that. Uh, so it's really about matching up the resources to the artists. I also encourage you all, you know, don't just go to places like this. Don't just go to, to places like, as much as I love the Old Globe, don't just go to places like the Old Globe. There's um, uh, Neo Soul Tuesdays that I used to host where it's a bunch of black folks. There's a bunch of uh, events that are happening in San Diego that aren't like these, these uh, very high polished uh, places but you could find some real talent. If you go there, you might be inspired like, man, this cat this cat needs to be heard. Let me do something about it. So those are the things that, uh, the practical things that I would say that you can do to, to, to help uh, young indigenous voices.